thank you very much for coming out and you've got a beautiful library here. I'm originally from around Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. My grandfathers were coal miners. They came from Slovakia and Lithuania and they had to take all the terrible jobs just like the immigrants coming into the United States today. Uh, you know, from Mexico, Puerto Rico, all different parts of uh, the world. And it was not until their children and grandchildren were able to go to college and then, you know, be able to uh, advance themselves. So uh, I was lucky, I went to a little college called King's College in Wilkes-Barre. It's run by Holy Cross Fathers that run Stonehill College in Massachusetts, Sacred Heart College, and a little college in the Midwest called Notre Dame, and also one in Oregon, Portland. So uh, I studied history and government. I wanted to be a high school history teacher. I loved history, but there weren't any jobs in Pennsylvania. So I went to New Jersey, and I taught near New Brunswick, and my first teaching job was fourth grade. <laughs> Can you imagine how I felt, you know, I was, did student teaching with juniors in high school, and now I was fourth graders, you know, 10-year-olds, and I had a blind boy in the back of the class, Eddie Skrzynski, uh, a deaf girl in the front, and I had Danny, who was hyperactive, and I had 34 kids. So, and I didn't know what I was doing really, but you know, I knew more than they did, I think, except for the math. And they had, were just coming out with new math. And luckily, we had a divider. It was a former kindergarten room. And uh, so the guy on the other side, he took the kids that were really good in math and did the new math, and I did the old math. And then uh, we went to, then I taught seventh and eighth grade history. I love U.S. history. Anybody like history here? Just one? Well, it was current events for us. Oh, current <laughs> events. Okay. <laughs> and uh, then I got a master's in reading. I went to Newark State. It's called Kane University now. And I started teaching remedial reading. And we were in a new middle school and it was called Jonas Salk Middle School. And Kathleen, guess who I got to meet? Jonas Salk came for a dedication a couple years after. And so it was awesome just to meet the guy who helped so many millions of people throughout the world so they wouldn't get this terrible, you know, uh, polio. Then I met my wife, who's from originally uh, from Middlefield, near Middletown. Her dad was a dairy farmer, went to New York State, had many farms. Last farm there was Pine Plains, uh, not too far from Rhinebeck. And then his last farm was in a little town called Oniko, near, which is part of Sterling, near the Rhode Island border near Econk Hill Turkey Farm. Anybody ever go there for ice cream? You've, Gail's been there. So uh, it was great to learn about farming and we were married in a Canterbury church and then a reception in Plain Field and the restaurant and the uh, motel is out of business. <laughs> That was 47 years ago, and then we were lucky to get a job in the Catskill Mountains, a little town called Delhi, which is near Oneonta, and uh, there I taught seventh grade reading. And you really didn't have reading most of the time. Reading stopped in the classroom basically around sixth grade, but they had me teach seventh graders just reading, and they had an English teacher too. So I was able to do a lot of interesting things, uh, creative things, because uh, there were no syllabuses, you know. I did what I wanted to do. And I did individualized reading, so I had kids choose books to read. And so everybody was reading different books. You know, sometimes I might do like The Outsiders together, uh, or I might do an Adirondack book together. Uh, so it was great to do it, making movies. And I raised our three kids. We had a, an old farmhouse along the west branch of the Delaware River. And that was when you could just, like from here to there is the Delaware River. 
and go swimming. We had a swimming hole and we had a 10 acre farm with a big barn, cow barn, silo, and we paid 27,500 in 74, <laughs> can you believe it? But it was a dump. It was abandoned for two years and it was a fraternity house before that for the junior cops. So there were smashed windows, but when you're young, you know, and you're the only one uh, working, so it was great to just do one room at a time. And uh, then when we retired, uh, we came to Connecticut, first in Colchester for five years, near the Salmon River, and then we bought a place on Lake Pocatapog, where we live in 2011, and we were fortunate because my parents grew up in the Depression. They saved money. So when they passed away, we were able to buy a house, put solar power, build a new house, greenhouse, solar power, geothermal, had a Prius car. We'd like to get a Tesla someday. So I was just talking to people at the uh, library conference there at uh, the Groton Hotel, and they said, five years, 30% of our cars will be all electric. They will have less moving parts. You won't have to do oil changes. And you just plug it in. And so less pollution. So I, that'll be great. So I, as uh, Ann said, I first got interested in um, writing because I used to have authors come to my school tried to get the kids interested in reading by having a real author. I went to parochial school, so we only read one book during the year. It was a basal text. Did anybody ever have a basal text? You read one story a day. Look up the vocabulary, answer the questions. Does that sound familiar to anybody? So how could you like to learn to read? We, we didn't even have a library in our town. Uh, you had to go to Wilkes-Barre or Kingston to be able to go do it. So when I became a reading teacher, I just wanted to get my kids to meet real authors. So uh, I first started with the book, it was called My Side of the Mountain. I don't know if anybody ever read that book by Gene Craighead George. And a boy said, Mr. Podscotch, this book is all about Delhi, where I'm teaching. I said, you're kidding me, about Delhi? He opened the book and there it was, boy leaves New York City and comes to Delhi in the Catskills to find his grandpa Gribley's farm. And then how he goes into the woods and lives fall, winter, and spring off the land, tames a hawk to be able to hunt for him and uh, you know, doing all these things, natural things. And Jean George won the Newbery Award for that book. She also won Julie of the Wolves and I looked in the back of the book and I said, Chappaqua, New York. I'm in New York. So I called information for Chappaqua and I asked for Jean George. They gave me her phone number. So one night I had courage and I dialed the number and a lady answered. And I said, is Jean George in? And she said, speaking? I'm just a teacher from Delhi. Oh, Delhi, what a wonderful town. And I told her how we're poor. We can't have authors coming and pay them to come. How would you like to be our first author for our book fair? I'd love to come. And I, we didn't have to pay anything. So then I told other writers, Jean George was coming. Whoa. So we had 15 authors. And t kids, teachers from K through 12 could choose authors to, to listen to. We had newspaper writers, photographers. Later on, we just called it the media fair. So for 25 years, I had free authors every year. And I had Eric Carl stay at my house. He wrote The Hungry Caterpillar, came from the Berkshires, stayed at my house, and then in the morning after I made breakfast for him, my daughter sat on his lap and he read The Hungry Caterpillar. Sounder by Bill Armstrong. He taught at Kent School for Boys, 
He took a day off, came, stayed over. Gene George came to my house. My friend took me the day before we picked wild leeks. I don't know, did anybody ever go into the woods and get wild leeks? And made her wild leek soup. She said, Marty, this is the best soup I've ever had. So uh, how about Howard Koch? Anybody ever hear of this guy? In 1943, he won the Academy Award for writing the movie Casablanca. Called him up from Woodstock, right down the road. Hey, would you like to come? I'd love to come. 87 years old. Here he is coming into the library, talking to all these high school kids. He said, during the 1950s, McCarthy, senator, called me and other people communists. I couldn't get a job after winning the Academy Award. He said, I had to go all the way to London and write books under a pen name. And he said, you kids, if you believe in something and the whole world is against you, stand up for what you think is right. <sighs> Haywood Hale Brune from CBS came. I just, I had Ian Ballantyne. Do you ever see Ballantyne books? Remember in the 50s, he started the whole paperback revolution. He took the pearl off the shelf. See that, kids? I got this book published. You know, The Hobbit? I had this book published. So, I mean, so I was immersed in all these writers. and They'd stay at my house. Guess what? Visited a fire tower, told a publisher about it. He said, somebody should write a book about it. I got a contract, $100 advance. Now, Susan, I heard you're a writer. I got a hundred dollar advance. Oh my God, I thought that was fabulous, right? But that comes out of the profit because he got 90% and I got 10% of the profit. So that was the funny thing. But so I went from fire towers, let's see. Well, this is the book I'm gonna talk about now. Now, does anybody know where in Connecticut this, the cover for my book is? You think it's mystic? There it is, you're right. This is the North Baptist Church. And I heard it's changed now. The name, it's, they don't call it the North and South, somebody said. Union. And I met the guy who works at this library behind there. I didn't even know there was a library behind there, the Noank Mystic Library. Did anybody go there? And he said he was helping with the upstairs part. They said it looks like a ship upside down. And it was all a, a, a ceiling covering all this. And they took all that ceiling down. Anybody ever go up there, the second floor? So I've got to go to see that. So I was lucky to get this uh, on the cover, and it's fabulous. When I went on Better Connecticut with CBS, with uh, Scott Haney, I gave him the book, and he said, Marty, what a cover, what a book, you know? And it's... I mean, it even went in Connecticut Magazine, December issue. I was on Fox News two weeks ago, the Hartford Current. So people are finding out about this. And the whole idea is to get people to visit all 169 towns in Connecticut. So first question, we're giving a prize now. Who could tell me how many counties there are in Connecticut? Eight. What's your first name again? Chuck. Chuck? Ten points. Remember that, Ann. <laughs> okay, because at the end we're getting a prize. Chuck. Chuck is going to keep Chuck. Ten points. Okay. Now, I was in the little town of Monroe, north, north, or wait, the western part of the state. Anybody ever go to Monroe? You've been there with that big reservoir there and everything? So this lady came to me, she said, Marty, I've got four kids. Last week, we've been doing this for years, trying to see if we could visit all 169 towns, and we got to our last town. She said, now with your book, guess what? We're going to start all over again because it's a passport book. You have to get it stamped or signed. So my book, if I could find it, I'll pass this around. I started going around. You'll see. See the gold thing there? You go to the town clerk. Some town clerks will put the gold seal and put the town seal right in your book. 
So you could pass that around just to see. And so here, uh, her name is Shirin. She took these, her four kids, look at, can you imagine how many little kids have been to Yale University, <laughs> you know, and going exploring. Uh, here, I went to Goshen and I got the town clerk who wrote the part. See, I ha had to do is get writers from all these towns, 169 towns, to write about their town. Just like I had Judy, she wrote about your town of Groton, okay? So I, I called the historical society, we're too busy, we can't write five to 600 words about our town. So I asked the library, no, I asked, the town clerk, she said, I'll do it. So I had that. And you could go to, uh, sometimes you might like to get a stamp. So you could go to the post office and just put a stamp there and they'll stamp it. Although one town would not let somebody do it. I think it was Hebron. The, <laughs> the guy in the post office or lady wouldn't put the stamp on there but you get the date and the, and the uh, town. Yeah, they have, uh, they have wine passes, et cetera. They go try to go to all the wineries. Uh, here's one, I went to Oxford. And they, if you go to the western part of the state, where's our Fairfield lady? Susan, mm -hmm. did you ever go to Riches? Maybe that's, this is in the uh, further north, Oxford. Everybody there likes we go to Oxford. Uh, here I am, not too far in, uh, let me think about this town, Old Lyme, okay? And right when you're going to Gillette Castle, you get off uh, the uh, ferry, there's this little store, has sandwiches, etc. and look at the Hadline Country Market. They even had a nice stamper. And Zachary signed it because Zachary couldn't believe it. He's right in the picture. And his mother owns the <laughs> store. My granddaughter gets the byline because she took the picture. Then I went to Sterling, okay, uh, on the Rhode Island border. It's a place called Econ Kill Turkey Farm. Anybody ever go there? Gail's been there. People rave. They love to go to Econ Kill. And there, they raise turkey, they're all free range, okay? And they have this dog, Big Blue. He guards the, the flock. So no eagle, no hawks, fisher cats, uh, kill them. Very expensive meat. Somebody said it's about $5 a pound. But Wesleyan College, you know, in Middletown, guess where they get all their turkey and ice cream? Eat, con, kill. I took, you want to go out, go to these colleges. I don't know if you knew this. You could go to Tr Trinity College. You could go to Wesleyan. You just go to their dining room. Bon Appetit is the caterer at Wesleyan. So you get this wonderful meal, $7, all you could eat. They have buffet, everything. I took my granddaughters there. Same thing up in Trinity. Anybody ever go up to Trinity College? They have a nice theater. They have sometimes foreign films, etc. Go right into their, their cafeteria and you could get nice dinner. Cheap date. How many been to Litchfield? Arethusa. This is a, a, a fabulous dairy and they have an ice cream place and a restaurant. Then I went to Washington. Anybody ever go to the town of Washington? Okay. How many have ever watched the Gilmore Girls? The whole story of the Gilmore Girls is supposed to be in Washington, Connecticut. And the mother is raising her daughter and she has a bed and breakfast, okay? So I said, oh boy, I can hardly wait to take my granddaughters to Washington and be able to see, you know, this bed and breakfast. So I did, I took my wife to the Let's see, what is this place? Oh boy, there is a bed and breakfast. Grace Mayflower Inn, anybody ever go there? 
so I took her for lunch, and I just went for the heck of it to desk to see how much does it cost to stay for a night. She said, this was December, she said, special deal. Prices went down for one night to stay at this Mayflower Inn, five hundred dollars. And if you get the really expensive room, sixteen hundred dollars a night. Washington. Washington. No, because have you ever heard of the Gun Academy? They have their own. The kids have their own hockey rink their own gym, their library, not just ordinary windows, Tiffany windows, big bucks up there. So I went, I did a book signing at the Hickory Stick bookstore, and she sold boxes of them, of my book, and I said, where could I go to get some nice soup? She says, go next door to Marty's. How many Marty's are there? Not too many, so I went there, and I said, could, is Marty around? He could sign my book, you know, it's a passport book. She said, I'm sorry, Marty passed. But I'll sign it. So there I have the waitress, she signed it. I went to uh, the library to give a talk in Enfield. So I wanted to look for soup, so always hearing about Red Robin. Anybody ever go to a Red Robin restaurant? Red Robin, okay, yum. So I went there, went there, had some soup, and I had the waitress sign it. Went to board, uh, Barnes and Noble, and the librarian signed it too. So West Hartford, you know, classy West Hartford. I went to Boston Market. All the soup, Kathleen, four ninety-five. You could eat. You could have ten bowls. Okay, and then this guy, I also did a travel book to all the Adirondack, 102 towns, and I'll pass this one around to you. I did five books in the Adirondacks, and I noticed people just don't go to all the towns, you know, in the Adirondacks. They go to Lake Placid, Lake George, Old Forge, that's it. I did, I've I, to gather my stories, I had to give talks like this in all the towns, and that's where I get my stories to write a book, because there aren't any books. Fire towers, CCC camps. So I did this book, and you also had to get that. But where did I get the idea? Vermont. Anybody like to go to Vermont here? Susan? Oak Chuck? Ben and Jerry's, yeah. So I found out that in 1954, a guy wrote a story saying everybody in, Connecticut, or in Vermont Magazine, his name is Professor Peach, he said, I want you to go and visit all of Vermont. Take the road less traveled. And how many love Vermont? It is gorgeous. So. That's where I got the idea. If Vermont could do 251 Club, I'll do 102 Club. But this guy, he was uh, a hockey coach at Colgate University okay, in Hamilton, and he just got so fascinated with the 102 Club that he has 3,000 signatures by going to all the, just these 102 towns. Here is the town of Danamora in the book. See, he went to the post office, and he's got people writing comments and stuff like that. As he drove up into the town of Danamore, I don't know if anybody ever heard of Danamore. Well, they have a prison right in the middle of town. So he drives in. He said, Marty, there were hundreds, thousands of police, state troopers, soldiers all over the place. CNN was there. What was going on? the big jailbreak out of this 1830 prison. How did these two guys escape? The one lady that worked in the prison fell in love with one of the guys, and she told them, helped them to be able to get out, told them how to get to this 
Do you remember this in the news? Dan Amora. The police for weeks were searching the woods in the Adirondacks. Okay? So he goes up to the CNN thing. Would you sign my book? And they said, oh, this is a great idea. We should do a story about this. So this is the crazy thing. You meet people all, o all over the place. So hopefully you'll be able to get this. So what I started doing, I divided my book into sections. Say New London, okay, county, your county. So when, you're da when you got to this section, I have the towns alphabetically and you could start doing a certain section. So I started crossing out the ones that I had visited, but believe it or not now, I visited all of these towns and I, did, I really crossed those out. So New London County is done. But that, if you buy a book today or sometime in the future, uh, and you start traveling, you could do that. And then in the back of the book, you keep track. You try to see if you could visit you know, all the towns, put the date down. Because if you get to all the towns, guess what? You get a million dollars. No. Okay, you get an award. Now I'm trying to think of what would be an award we could give them. Would we give it the Nutmeg Award? Would we give it a prime member? That's what they do in Vermont. They give you, you become a prime member, okay, and they have a luncheon in Montpelier, and the governor comes and gives those people, you know, who are members. But I wanted something historical. So for the Vermont, or the Adirondack one, I gave what they call the Vagabond Award. Does anybody know historically who the Vagabonds were in the 1920s? They went camping every year, twice to the Adirondacks, sometimes down to Virginia, Edison, Ford, Firestone, and John Burroughs, the naturalist from the Catskills. I don't know if you ever heard of them. And the reporters following called them the Vagabonds. So that's what I gave for that. So I needed something historical, somebody who traveled around Connecticut. Anybody know? Don't say anything, Ann, because Ann knows the answer. Anybody? Kathleen? Well, there was a guy, 1865 to 1886. He was a homeless guy. He wore clothes of leather. And he traveled around the state in his last six years. He made this 365 mile tra trip from the Hudson River to the Connecticut River and back in 34 days approximately. He lived in caves. He took pieces of leather left over, you know, people's boots, and he stitched them together. Imagine wearing leather clothes. And they said, this is a book, I was in Essex Library and telling them about this. Four days after my talk, I had a package in the mail. This lady bought me the book, because it's hard to find, it's out of print, about the leather man. And all it is is excerpts from you know, daily or weekly newspapers in the towns that he visited, because that's the only knowledge they have. They have no idea what his name was, where he came from, they think he came from France, didn't speak English, and people just fed him. I, I was at the conference today, a uh, librarian conference, and this lady said, my grandmother told me, her great-grandmother told me how she would feed this guy. They would just leave the food out for him. Some, I forget where it was, in Hamden maybe. So I'll pass this around. So if you visit all the towns at a dinner, we're going to have every year, we're going to have a dinner. This year, we're going to have it in the geographic center of the state, Berlin. Berlin. Now you don't say Berlin, Berlin. But there's a picture of them there. And so I had a person uh, do that. From 1883 is when he did this every, uh, for six years until he died, this 365 mile trip. And 
Some of you may have heard this guy on about six weeks ago. He came from England. He's studying at Quinnipiac College for a master's in teaching. And he went to a cave because he's one of these long distance walkers. He walked across the Sahara Desert. Uh, he uh, walked across England. So when he came here, he went to a cave. What the heck is this leather man stuff? So he read the book and he said, I'm going to do that whole trip. So he started in Sparta. I don't know if you know where the cemetery is near the Hudson River. And he did the trip and he wanted to do it in seven days. He had, he was hooked up to a satellite dish, uh, satellite, and it went to his website. And you could follow him hour by hour where he was on this trip. So it was um, St. Patrick's Day, just finished dinner. And I looked on the map and he was coming into Middletown. My God, this was my chance. So I got in the car. I called up my writer from uh, Guilford because he had a computer. I didn't have a, sm I, I had still had a flip phone. So he's telling me, I'm in Middletown. I said, where is he at now, Joel? He said, he's coming down Route 66, right at the intersection of Middlefield, and he's coming down, so co coming towards Staples. So I drive on Route 66, and it's dark now. Oh my God, how the hell am I going to find this guy? So there are these two headlights, two people walking down on Route 66. I pulled over right behind them into this driveway. Connecticut Forest and Park. I don't know if you know where that is, their office. And I said, got out of the car, are you the leather man? In his British accent said, yes, I am. <laughs> so I went out there and I handed him the, the leather man patch. I said, this is the award because you're going on this, this journey. He says, I don't deserve this because I haven't visited all 169 towns. You deserve it. So I said, can I buy you some food? You know, because guy's got, he's doing about 50 miles a day, you know, to, to get this in seven days. And he's walking with a limp, so I, I didn't think he was going to make it in ten, seven days. So he says, yeah, we're going to go. He was walking with just somebody just for a part of the trip uh, from the Connecticut Forest and Park. Anybody a member of Connecticut Forest and Park Association? So he said, we're going to go to Starbucks. So I said, I'll buy you, uh, you know, s some food. So I drove down there, got all set, got a table all set for him. Uh, in about 10 minutes, they walk in, you know. Here he is exhausted, you know. So I have a table. I said, there, Ian, you could sit right there. And he saw four chairs, you know, comfy chairs. Can I sit there? <laughs> he took off his, his, his shoes, you know, just to give his feet a little rest. And he wanted a double latte with a lot of caffeine in it, to, you know, because he had to keep going to uh, walking. Uh, and uh, I, I showed him the book, and he had read it, and he's telling me all this, the stuff, the different caves. He said when he was going to uh, Thomaston, you know where Thomaston is? Okay, by Waterbury. That's where they made the Thomaston clock. Well, there is a cave there. So along the trip, sometimes people would join him. So. He knew this guy from, I think it was maybe Watertown, and his son. So his son, 14-year-old son, volunteered. He's walking with them, and all of a sudden, you had this downburst, lightning, thunder. They made it to the Leatherman Cave, and they spent the night there. It was so bad, and that's why he was slowed down a little bit. But he told the different things that were happening along the trip, and... Uh, how he met a girl and he's going to get married to her in July. She teaches at, or does something at UConn, so I guess he's going to stay. And I asked him to come to our dinner in September 7th in Berlin. So that would be, be good to have him. Nick Bar, uh, Bellantoni, okay? Anybody ever have him? Isn't he fabulous? Oh, if you ever get a chance, did you listen to Nick Bellantoni? He's so energetic. Oh my God, he was just, he came to our library too. So that's it. Now this is the trip that he, uh, 
the leather man would make up towards uh, down to Meriden, along the Connecticut River, Essex, and then he would uh, come down through here, uh, Branford, and then he went around New Haven. He was not, you know, looking for a lot of people. And then coming down, and then to Hamden. Now Fairfield is down in here? Yeah. Okay, so he didn't go that far. And then he came up through here. I, you know, not too sure in the book you'd be able to check it out. Oh, there I am. <laughs> With Lee Stewart is his name, Evans. And uh, where I handed him the thing. A little guy just like the leather man, and he's dark skin, and uh, same height and about the same weight. So he was telling me, that's it. So there we are at Starbucks. <laughs> so I got to meet him. There he is pointing out, you know, uh, the pages of, uh, some people would sneak to try to lure the leather man to take pictures. And these are the olden days when you know, photography was, they would try to get him to get, uh, to get a picture of him. Where is the idea of travel come from, I told you? I read a story in 2008 about the Vermont 251 Club. And here was a guy, a couple from Schenectady. They heard about it, and they would just have volunteers keeping track of people. You know, who was the first person, second person, third person, etc. going, and, and everybody keep their own record. You could lie if you want to. You know, and say, oh, I did it, and you'd still get the prime member award. And it was all Dr. Peach, and he taught at, taught at Norwich. I'm in the Manchester Library talking about Professor Peach coming, you know, and writing this story, and he died about a year or two after he wrote that article in 54. This old-time guy that was answering all the questions comes up to me, like we're doing answering questions. He said, Marty, I went to Norwich Academy. Professor Peach was my English teacher. Can you imagine the people I meet? So I thought that was astounding. And there they are in Montpelier getting their awards. So if Vermont could have 251, and there are 251 towns, then after writing five books about the Adirondacks and traveling all over and meeting these wonderful people. And you know what? Because you're a teacher, I didn't have the money to stay in motels. Guess what? The people would take me in for the night. And who's taking me in for the night here? <laughs> Anybody volunteer? I bring my sleeping bag, my pillow, and a towel. <laughs> That's what I do in the Adirondacks. <laughs> One time I got to Mayfield and somebody was supposed to take me in for the night, you know, because I, I spoke to this, the Historical Society in Mayfield. And they said, sorry, Marty. My wife has got company over. You can't stay over. Would anybody in the audience want to take in Marty for the night? And guess what? Somebody, this old guy raised his hand. He had, uh, had the, the lumber yard in town. He said, Marty, I'll take you. So I wound up at this. You never know where you're going to stay. So there's where I travel. And I, as I said, people are so nice, they take me in. Last year, I gave a talk in Hague on Lake George. This lady took me in. Log cabin, acres of land on Lake George. Her grandfather bought all this land up. And he had these racing boats, these wooden racing boats in the 1920s and 30s. They would have this race. I don't know how many, how many times they would go around there. And that was a big thing there. So, so there's my book, which I'm passing around. I had the state senator encouraging people, visit all of our beautiful Adirondacks. And you'll go to ice cream places up in the Adirondacks. And guess what? How would you like to go to that place? Yeah. Wishy's ice cream. Somebody at the library conference yesterday, she says, I'm from Krogan, and I used to go to Wishy's in Krogan below. <laughs> I mean, it's just oh, crazy. And there are the vagabonds. And look at the way they went camping. Suit and ties. They didn't go to, what's the, 
Outfitters or what the, what? REI or what's the one from Maine? L.L. Bean. Bean Clothes. Look at this. Climbing trees, walking through the woods. That was the way they camped. And they all had electric lights in their tent. Why? Edison brought a generator. And Ford had his truck with a can, uh, cooking thing on the back. And they, somebody, if you go to Dearborn, the, the Ford Museum, that, that truck is there. And they're the reporters following these uh, guys. So that's the patch which I passed around. And we have a dinner. The lady said, we're not having a luncheon. We're having a dinner. So we had a dinner there. The next year we had in Queensbury. Last year, Ticonderoga. This year, Hotel Saranac. So if anybody wants to come. Then I came to Connecticut, okay? And I said, why drive all the way four or five hours up to the Adirondacks when I could just drive around Connecticut? So I started driving around and doing, interviewing these men who were in the Civilian Conservation Corps from 33 to 42. I just love doing these books, okay? This is my second book. I did the Adirondack CCCs. My third book, CCC, guess what state? I'm halfway done. Pennsylvania? No, that's too big. Close by. Yes. Ten points for Susan. Okay, Rhode Island. I love Rhode Island. Anybody like to go to Rhode Island? Oh, man. I'm going to be in the Charlestown Library in three weeks. I gave a talk in, let's see, starts with a W. Westerly Library. 126-year-old building. They even own the park next to it. I've even been to Wapachet and Arcadia. So I'm, there are only eight camps, 21, you know, in Connecticut. So this is easy, easy street. I lo- but I love Connecticut, or uh, Rhode Island. And they have the woods. They've got the beaches. They're not crowded, you know, like Connecticut or the, uh, the other states. So look at, I'm traveling around my new state of uh, Connecticut, and I'm saying, God, this is a gorgeous state. They've got everything, mountains, lakes, ocean, farms, quaint villages, cities. So now I had to find exactly two years ago, I was searching at the library conference in Groton, uh, trying to find somebody. I'd ask him, hey, Ann, what town are you from? How would you like to write 500 to 600 words, a little history in interesting places in Groton? No. Then I'd ask, what's your first name again? Jack. Jack. What town? Groton. Norwich. Norwich. Okay. And he said, I'll do it. Okay. So that's the way I first started out. Then I started calling up historical societies, <coughs> clerks, town clerks, select wherever I could find somebody who could write five to six hundred words. Too bad I didn't know Susan. She could have been one of my authors. Okay, so here's an example. You've got a little history. So when you go into the town, you could read a couple paragraphs. What went on in this town that you're driving through? What are some interesting places from local people telling you? Not me, because I don't even, I don't know. So send me some pictures, the Bethlehem, and look at the writers I was dealing with. Where's Judy's name? Tell Mellis. What is her name? Tell Mellis. Okay. Next page. page. There it is. There's Judy. Tell Mellis. Okay. So look at this. I was dealing with all these variety of people, and... My fingers were getting sore to the bone. I even wrote a story about my town, East Hampton, and I had my granddaughter help me. And there she is. During Christmas holiday, I said, Kira, how would you like to be an author? 
She said, okay, Papa. So we sat down and in three hours, we had our 500 words done, okay? So it wasn't a big thing, but some people take months, you know, because they wanted everything to be just perfect. I had the state historian, which I still haven't met yet. Anybody ever have him? They said he's dynamic. Any, nobody? And there, my first day with the books. This library or bookstore in South Windsor said, Marty, let's host the first day with the book. So guess what? We had nine of my 183 writers came and each one talked about their book and their writing. And at the end, guess what? People came up and bought a book and the book went and all the writers got to sign their page because they're the authors. So it was, and this was my first time meeting these people because all I did was on the phone or email. And still, like today was the first day I met Judy. Okay, now we're gonna, t now wait, Susan's got the advantage. Did you grow up in Fairfield, Susan? Okay, and ready? Get your thinkers on, first hand raised. What town? Look at this building, it's called the river. Chapel, library, a gym, a restaurant. Look at the glass. These rich people in this town, they didn't want it to be a development. They bought it up and did this, this, uh, this thing, hiking trail, go there for free. It's called Grace, Grace Farm. Anybody ever go there? Nobody's ever been there? Well, once you join the club and you get traveling, Go to see it, it's free too, and a great restaurant. It's almost right by the border of Westchester County. One more mile, you go on Route 123 where my son and daughter-in-law live. How about this one? 10 points. I'll give you a hint, it starts with an S. Sherman, it's on the top of Candlewood Lake. Anybody ever go there? And the Historical Society has the old general store and they have a gift shop. Okay, now we go to Litchfield. It's a covered bridge, but what town? Sharon. Because one side of this covered bridge is in Sharon. What's the other side? Cornwall. Cornwall Bridge. Okay. The oldest continuously used covered bridge. Look at that thing. I think it was in the 55 flood it was washed out and they had to rebuild it. How about this town? Starts with an N. This is a railroad station. It had a fire. It's now a brewery. North Canaan. It's very confusing, that area. You got Canaan, North Canaan, and part of Canaan is Falls Village. Okay, beautiful. How many been to Kent Falls? You people don't get out of Groton. Come on, join the club. It's a hike, but it's gorgeous up there. Okay, New Haven. Now, who knows for 20 points the name of this building? Okay, this is called the Harkness Tower. The Harkness family had their son going to Yale. He died while he was going to school there. The Harknesses made their money with Standard Oil, Rockefeller. So they built this tower in his memory, and they have, you could go, so look, see the spiral staircase? You could be able to tour this tower, and guess what my phobia is? And I did three books on fire towers. I can't even get up, <laughs> but I wrote the story about the men in the towers, okay? And look at, did anybody hear the carillon music? They say you have to almost like hit the, the, the things. Have you ever played a carillon? I've seen it done. Have you seen it? Yeah, I think Smith College did that. Smith College has it? And there's some other place in Connecticut that has carillon music. I don't, I don't remember. Okay. Guilford. Yeah, and they, they even have tours. You have to go onto this island. I love Guilford. 
<gasps> Anybody go to Guilford? They have a beautiful square, nice shops, coffee shop. Same thing with Branford. <gasps> God, these towns. Nice. This is a Russian church. See it inside there? Okay. 1920s, the Russian Revolution. A lot of you were an engineer or a writer. You were being killed. These people escaped, came to the uh, United States, and they formed the colony, built little cottages. They worshiped in this church, okay? It's in Southbury, right near, almost about a mile from Route 84. It's, and they loved this because they reminded them with the white uh, birch trees of being in Russia. They had their own Russian newspaper. Uh, Tolstoy's nephew lived there. Tolstoy's daughter lived in Haddam, right near the Haddam CCC camp, raised chickens, you know, had a little farm there. Okay, Middlesex, getting close now. Okay, this is the one I live, and I live in East Hampton, which has the town of Cobalt, Middle Haddam, okay, and regular East Hampton. And, say it again. Portland. Correct. Brownstone Quarry. 40 points. It's the Brownstone Quarry. Look at this place. They quarried the brownstone. You go to New York City. Probably saw a lot of your brownstone pla uh, places in New York City. They brought the brownstone right from Portland, this big quarry. Imagine all the stone they quarried out of there for houses, sidewalks. There's two towns here. Wait, Susan. What? East Haddam. 10 points for Kathleen. Is that the first? No, 20. And you, Haddam, 10 points. I didn't ask for it, though. <laughs> I said that I got no points. <laughs> she got no points. Okay. How many like to go to good speed? I'll be there next week. How was the Music man? Music man, yeah. It's, if you like musicals, how many went to see Singing in the Rain? Oh, God. What they did is they had a special grant. Somebody donated money. They put a special thing to collect the water and then pump it up again. So this guy's dancing on the stage and it's raining. It was uh, just unbelievable. And there it is, 1867. Okay, anybody like wineries? Give you a hint, starts with a C. Cheshire? No. Nope. 10 points, Clinton. Look at this place. It's called Chamard Winery. They said, and they also have a little restaurant there. Anybody go there? Okay. Hartford County. This is Collinsville, which is in the town of Canton. Anybody ever go to Collinsville? They said the museum is wonderful, so I got to go to see this. They even have an iron casket in there, which is, but look at, look at the machetes, shipping them all over the world. Axes, if you go, boys, these old axes, they'll have uh, Collinsville, Manchester. They, this was the Cheney factory building. Listen to this class. They had 175 acres 275 mill buildings. They had farmers in the area raising mulberry trees to be able to feed the silkworms. It was unbelievable. Okay, look at this. And the historical society was given this one building there. But then when rayon was developed, DuPont, that was the end of the silk factories and the Cheney factory. This is awesome. 1837 house. They have tours. Starts with an S. The town. This is in Southington. And it's called the Barnes Museum. 
It was given to the library and the library runs this museum. It's, it's gorgeous. Two ladies take care of it and they take care of the garden, painting, running tours. So if you get to Southington, get off of 84 and go downtown. New London. Okay, now no excuses. Groton. Groton. Okay. How many have been in the Nautilus? What town? Stonington. It's a part of the ta two towns, parts of two towns. East Lyme. It's in the little town of Niantic, but it's this. How many have been to the book barn? Isn't Randy something? He knows his books. There he is, Randy. His workers keep that place spick and span. Everything is in order, right? I'll tell you, you need a book, there's the place to go. Okay, Tolland, uh-oh, we're going far. Whew, this is a tough one. Built by the WPA in 1939. I have to tell you this one. Fox Hill Tower, and it's in Vernon. Okay, I'll be speaking there. So I'll, I want to go to see this tower. Look at how gorgeous it is. It's in the little, it's in a village of stores, but it's in the town of Mansfield. There are many towns that have smaller parts to them that were joined together. How about this one? You go to this restaurant, the only restaurant in this town, you have a meal and you get free books in the town of Union on your way going up 84 to Worcester. Somebody said that's the center of Massachusetts. I just learned that today. Okay, you go there, they have used books all around the place. You just pick up a book and you have that with your meal and you go, everybody gets a free book. On this deserted road, you have to go on a side road to get to Fish Family Farm. Okay, Wyndham. That was a big industry there, the thread industry. They have beautiful stone buildings made into apartments. And they have a beautiful museum showing the history of that industry. Okay, Roseland Cottage. This is the last one, then we'll go home. Okay, Thompson has a speedway. Look at, really old, they have a golf course there, but I haven't been to it yet. So now begin your quest, class, as a member of the Connecticut 169 Club, to not only visit all the towns, villages, but to get to know the people of this beautiful state. Let's all take the road less traveled. And I would like to thank you very much for coming. Class dismissed.